we finished verse number 5 of chapter 5 the last time that I taught about a month ago. So we're ready to move on to verse number 6 tonight. But before we do that, let me quickly review the first five verses in chapter 5. In verse number 1, God is seen holding a book in his right hand. That book is the title deed to earth. In verse number 2, we see this mighty angel, this strong angel, step forward and he shouts, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seven seals? And verse 3 tells us that no man is found worthy in heaven, on earth, or under the earth. So in verse number 4, John begins to weep. And the reason he's weeping is because he understands that if no one is found worthy to open the book and to loose the seals, then the world is going to continue on in its sinful condition for all of eternity. And that's why John is weeping. But in verse number 5, an elder steps forward, puts his hand on John, at least that's the way I pictured, and he tells John to stop weeping. The line of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed. He's worthy to open the book and to loose the seals. So John turns expecting to see a lion, but he doesn't see a lion. He sees a lamb. And that's where we pick it up in verse number 6. So if you would, turn with me in your Bible to Revelation chapter 5, and let's read verse number 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Now, of course, we know that the lamb that Jesus or that John is seeing is Jesus Christ. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. That's pretty evident. But it brings up an interesting question. When we get to heaven, what will Jesus look like? Will he look like a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes? Is he going to look like what John saw here in the book of Revelation? No, Jesus is going to look exactly like he looked when he walked here upon this earth. So why is John seeing these things? Why does John see Jesus as a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes? Well, it's because it's a vision. You see, John's vision is just like Pharaoh's dream in Genesis chapter 41. How many of you have read your Bible through an entire year? How many of you have read your Bible through at least once in your life? How many of you have read the book of Genesis? All right. In Genesis chapter 41, there's this story about Pharaoh and Joseph. Pharaoh has this dream. And if you remember, in his dream, he is standing on the bank of the Nile. And seven fat cows come up out of the Nile and they begin to feed on the grass. And shortly after that, Seven skinny, ugly cows come up out of the Nile and they eat the seven fat cows. But what's interesting is, after they eat the seven fat cows, you would never know it. They are still skinny and ugly. They're still all bones. Now, Pharaoh's dream was symbolic. Does that make sense? The seven fat cows represented seven years of prosperity. The seven skinny cows represented seven years of famine. The famine was to be so bad that it would devour all of the prosperity. That's what it means that the seven skinny cows ate the seven fat cows. This famine is going to be so bad that it's going to devour all of the prosperity from the previous seven years. Now, John's vision is just like Pharaoh's dream. He's literally seeing these things in his vision. He's literally seeing a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. But they're not to be taken literally. The things that he's seeing are symbolic. When you get to heaven, you will not see Jesus as a lamb with seven horns and seven eyes. You'll see him as he was when he walked upon this earth. You'll see him as he was when he was resurrected. So what John is seeing in his vision is symbolic. When he sees Jesus, he does see him as a lamb that's been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. But what he's seeing is supposed to be interpreted symbolically as a metaphor. Now, does everyone know what a metaphor is? Because if you don't, you won't understand what I'm talking about. So let me explain what a metaphor is. A metaphor is a figure of speech. 
It's a figure of speech where one thing represents another. The purpose of a metaphor is to make a comparison between the two to show the similarities. So in this instance, the lamb with seven horns and seven eyes represents Jesus. And everything about this creature is to be compared to something that Jesus has. The lamb represents Jesus because Jesus willingly allowed himself to be sacrificed for our sins. Turn to Isaiah chapter 53 verse number 7. Notice what it says. He, talking about the Messiah, and we know Jesus is the Messiah. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. So we see the lamb representing Jesus. The similarities are there. John also sees the lamb with seven horns. Now, in the Old Testament, horns represented power. They symbolized power. Now, we're going to go a little bit further, and we're going to see horns on other creatures, and these horns represent authorities. But the reason why is because these are powers, these are kingdoms. But in the Old Testament, hor horns represented power. The number seven symbolizes completeness or all. Think about this. Seven days are a complete week. Or you might say all week is seven days. So the seven horns represents omnipotence. In other words, complete power or all powerful. So when he sees this lamb with seven horns, it's telling us that yes, he's the lamb that was slain for us, but he's omnipotent. Now, there's only one person or I shouldn't say person, but I have to, that's omnipotent. Who is that person? God. So what is this telling us? Jesus is God. Then we go a little bit further. The seven eyes represent omniscience. Because eyes represent seeing. And seven symbolizes, as I said, completeness or all. So when we combine these things and we see seven eyes, it means that Jesus is all-seeing, or in other words, he's omniscient. There's not anything that Jesus doesn't know. He sees everything. He's able to look inside your heart. And we go a little bit further, and we find out that these seven eyes are what? The seven spirits of God, which are the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. So what we see is that through the Holy Spirit, Jesus is able to look into the, inside your heart. He's able to see what your thoughts, your feelings are. You can't hide anything from Jesus. He sees everything. Now, verse 5 and verse 6 is one of the most beautiful mixed metaphors in all of the Bible. Now, does everyone know what a mixed metaphor is? I know we're going a little bit deep, but you need to understand this. A mixed metaphor is where something is represented by one thing, and a little bit later... It's represented by something completely different. Does that make sense? In verse 5, Jesus is seen as the lion, the lion of Judah. The lion represents Jesus. But in verse number 6, the very next verse, he's seen as a lamb. Now the lamb represents Jesus. That's what a mixed metaphor is. Does that make sense? But, it's a, but it is a beautiful mixed metaphor. In John's vision... Jesus is being transformed from one symbol to another. He's the conquering lion in verse number 5. But he's seen as the lamb in verse 6. Now, I want you to notice the transformation of the metaphors because it's very important. The final stage is what? The lamb. You see, the lamb did not transform into the lion. The lion transformed in to the lamb and not just a lamb but a lamb that was slain now let me explain why that is so important in verse number five we find that Jesus the line of Judah has prevailed now what does the word prevailed means well the word prevailed means to conquer to overcome to be victorious when John is weeping the elder steps forward and tells him don't weep the line of Judah the root of David has prevailed. And immediately, the picture that you paint is this conquering king. Who is the conquering king? He's the lion of Judah. He's all powerful. He has strength. But verse number 6 tells us how Jesus prevailed 
And it's not the way you would have ever guessed. In fact, it's one of the reasons the Jews rejected Jesus. Because the way he prevailed is not the way they expected the Messiah to prevail. He didn't conquer Satan, sin and death by physical strength like a lion. He conquered Satan, sin and death by enduring suffering and hostility and dying as a sacrificial lamb. And that's the whole point of verse 5 and 6. Jesus did not prevail over Satan by strength like a lion. He prevailed over Satan by his death on the cross. As a sacrificial lamb, Jesus prevailed over Satan, sin, and death. We were redeemed by the blood of the lamb, not by the strength of the lion. Now, it is impossible to overstate this magnificent transformation in chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. You must get this. Because everywhere where we look at the redemption of the saints, we see the Lamb. We see this meek Lamb. We see this picture of a Lamb that is led away. And it's meek and it's mild and it's slaughtered. And sometimes we think, wait a minute. I don't understand that. But this is what Jesus is, and this is how he has prevailed. So we can't overstate this magnificent transformation in chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. This line of Judah is transformed into a sacrificial lamb. But in this transformation, our victory is attained. Because of his death on the cross, we've been redeemed. And as a result of being redeemed, Jesus is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals and to redeem the earth. If Jesus would have tried to do it any other way, it would not have worked. But what is so wonderful about this, the scripture says that had the enemy known this, he never would have crucified Jesus. Did you know the Bible says that? This was so unexpected. What they expected was for the line to come and through his strength to prevail. But the truth of the matter is in order to redeem, the price had to be paid for our sins. He had to come as a sacrificial lamb. And now when we see this victorious overcomer, it's not in the way that we expected it, which was through strength, but it's through humility. So even though he's the line of Judah, it wasn't by his strength that he redeemed us. And that's very important. Verse number 7. And he came, and he took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Now, this is the transference of authority from God to Jesus. Or, this is the transfer of authority from God to Jesus. And at this point, Jesus now takes over. It's time to exercise his right to redeem the earth. But it's not going to happen overnight. How long is it going to take? It's going to take seven years. And this seven-year period is known as what? The tribulation. Now, it's not because Jesus couldn't do it immediately, but because Jesus is long-suffering and he wants everyone to have a chance. And we also found out, because of the book of Daniel, that there is a purpose for the tribulation. The first three purposes of the tribulation, or, or, or for the 70 weeks, was accomplished on the cross. But the last three things are going to be accomplished during the tribulation. We're going to see God do a mighty work in the nation of Israel. And it's kind of interesting. While we were in Israel, we went and we sat with an Orthodox Jew. And this Orthodox Jew was trying to explain the difference between Christian beliefs and Jewish beliefs and why they don't believe in Jesus as the Messiah. And so after he finished his little spill, I asked him a question. I said, are you looking for a Messiah? And if you are looking for a Messiah, what will he be like? Do you remember that question? And what's interesting is, his answer was exactly what the Antichrist will be. Unbelievable. Everything that he said is exactly what the Antichrist will be. They don't expect the Messiah to be any type of deity, but just a man. They expect the Messiah... To come in and to be able to broker peace for the world. They expect the Messiah to allow 
the third temple to be rebuilt. And how many of you know that there's an organization called the Temple Institute in Jerusalem. And this group of people believes that in our lifetime, the third temple is going to be rebuilt. And they're already making all of the articles of furniture to be placed in the temple. They're getting ready for it. And it's good that they are. Because we understand that right after the rapture and the Antichrist comes, he's going to do everything that the Orthodox Jews believe the Messiah is going to do. And they're going to welcome the Antichrist in as the Messiah until the middle of the tribulation. In the middle of the three and a half, or at three and a half year period, then the Antichrist is going to stand up and say, I'm to be worshipped. I'm God. That's the abomination of desolation. At that point, the Jews understand, wait a minute, we've been tricked. They're going to go back to the Scripture, specifically the book of Matthew. They're going to see that Jesus was the Messiah. You're going to have the two witnesses there. As we go through this, we're going to see. It's going to be preparing. You're going to have the 144,000 witnesses that's out telling them. And they're going to receive Jesus Christ as a whole nation, generally speaking. This is why it is going to be a seven-year process. Now, from this time on, from the time that Jesus takes the book from God's hand, everything that's written in the scroll is going to be carried out. And it's going to be carried out in exact accordance with what is written in the scroll. But we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. We're actually going to finish chapter 5 tonight. And next week, we're going to get to the first seal, which is the white horseman, right? That's going to be exciting. So let's not get ahead of ourselves. Look at verse number 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. You see, when Christ takes the scroll from God, the four beasts and the twenty-four elders are going to fall down before him. But I want you to notice what the twenty-four elders are holding in their hands. They're holding harps, which is a musical instrument. This is one of the reasons why we picture angels with harps. You know, we have the cartoon, someone dies, they go up, they're floating up, and they've turned into an angel. And what are they playing? A harp. Where do we get that? We get that from this verse. All right? The 24 elders are holding in their hands, number one, harps, and golden vials of incense. You see, the word odor or odors, is translated from the Greek word thumiema, which means incense. Now, John tells us that this golden vial of incense, or this golden vials, because they're plural of incense, are the prayer of saints. Did you know that our prayers are like incense to God? They have a sweet odor as long as we're praying for the things that is, are God's will. Look with me, if you would, in Psalms chapter 141, verse number 2. David says, now there's some debate as to is David writing this or not, but I believe David wrote it. Accept my prayer as incense offered to you, and my upraised hands as an evening offering. Now, why does he say this? Because the Jews believed that if a prayer was prayed in accordance to God's will, it's a sweet aroma to God. It's sweet smelling in his nostrils. And so they saw prayer as incense. And we find that in the Bible. Now, let me ask you a question. What's the connection between the golden vials of incense, which are the prayers of saints, and Jesus taking the scroll? Is there a connection? Is there a connection between our prayer and Jesus taking the scroll? Is there a connection between the prayers that you pray right now and Jesus taking the scroll? Well, yes, absolutely. Our prayers are what bring about this very moment. Our prayers are what allows this to take place. You see, ever since Jesus has taught us to pray, we've been praying for Jesus to take the scroll. We've been praying for Jesus to go up to God's right hand, take the scroll, and to redeem the earth. And most of you didn't even know that you were praying that, did you? But you have been. Remember how Jesus taught us to pray? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. For 2,000 years. Over 2,000 years. Christians have been praying. For God's kingdom. To come. 
and for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. What we've been praying for is for Jesus to return and for his kingdom to be established here on this earth. We've been praying for Jesus to take the scroll and loose the seals so his kingdom could come up on this earth and so God's will could be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And most of us didn't even know that's what that meant in that prayer. But when we're praying for thy kingdom to come, we're saying, Jesus, come back. We want your kingdom here on this earth. Rapture us out of here. Start this redemption process. And we've been praying for Jesus to take the scroll. So guess what happens? Remember that the rapture took place in chapter 4, verse number 1. The 24 elders represent who? The saints. So now we see the church in heaven. No more from the time of chapter 4 on do we see the church anymore except when they come back with Jesus. And we're riding on the white horses, right? All right? But we don't hear about the church. All of a sudden the focus is off of us and the focus is on Israel. But the reason the focus is off of us is because the focus is going to be on what's taking place on earth. Especially when we get through chapter 5. Right now we're seeing what's happening in heaven because what's happening in heaven at this very moment is what spurs these events on. And we have been praying for this. And so what takes place is when Jesus takes this scroll, our prayers are being fulfilled. And now that it's time to take the scroll and to loose the seals, all of the prayers that have been lifted up to God over a 2,000 year period, praying for this, this very moment, are finally answered. They weren't wasted prayers. They were stored up, waiting to be filled. And when the fulfillment comes, when Jesus steps forward and he takes the scroll, those prayers are released like a sweet aroma because now those prayers are being fulfilled. You know, it's kind of interesting. When prayers are fulfilled, it's almost like there's a feeling to it. You ever prayed for something and you see that and all of a sudden there's a joy inside? If we were spiritual, we could probably actually smell. It's like something has taken place. There's a kindling there and there's an aroma. Well, what's going to happen when Jesus steps forward? All those prayers we've been praying for are in these golden vials. And now that it's fulfilled, this aroma just comes up. Now, once the 24 elders who represent us, the royal priesthood, fall before him they begin to sing a new song. Which means that we are singing the new song because those 24 elders represent who? The royal priesthood. Remember, there were too many Levites. There were too many priests to minister at one time. So they divided them up into different groups. And when you wanted to call all of the priests together, you didn't call all the individuals, you called the 24 elders. So when he sees the 24 elders, these 24 elders represent the royal priesthood. And who are the real royal priesthood? We are. So when they begin singing a new song, it means that we as the saints in heaven are singing this new song. Verse 9. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Now, the song that's being sung is composed of three parts. The first part is the acclamation of Jesus' worthiness. Notice it. You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals. The second part is acknowledging the redemptive work of Jesus. For you were slain and you have redeemed us to God by your blood. And the last part is how it has affected us as believers. Verse 10, and you have made us to be kings and priests unto God, and we shall reign on the earth. You know, every once in a while, I find someone who doesn't like the way that I preach. Because I preach things that are very practical. I preach on how to have a good marriage. I preach on how to raise your children the way that God wants you to. I, I preach on how to be a good employer or a good employer. And people don't like that. But you know what's interesting? Even in this song of praise... I want you to notice at the very end, they sing about what? How what Jesus has done affects us. Even in heaven, what do we notice? That what Jesus has done has affected us. That's why I preach the way that I do. 
when I preach the word of God and I come to the end of my sermon, what I try to do is to show you how this particular sermon, this particular passage of scripture affects you. How you can apply it. And what's interesting is that's exactly what's taking place in heaven. Now I want you to notice that this song is considered to be a new song. I want you to underline the word new. It's the Greek word kahinos, which means a new kind, unprecedented or unique, something that's never been seen before. Now, why is that? Because right now, at the moment Jesus takes the scroll and the 24 elders and the four living creatures fall down before him and the 24 elders begin to sing this song, the reason they're doing this new song is because a new age has appeared. Now that Jesus has taken the scroll, the earth is now in the process of being redeemed and God's kingdom is about to come upon the earth. This new age brings in a new song. In the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, they could only sing about what took place in that Old Covenant. When Jesus came, we had a new song at that time. And the reason we had a new song is because Jesus had gone to the cross, He died for our sins, and God resurrected Him. And we sing about that. The old rugged cross, amazing grace. But you know what? When Jesus takes the scroll, another new age begins. That new age is where Jesus is going to return and the kingdom will finally be established on the earth. And with this new age comes a new song. Listen to the song that has never been sung before but will be sung when Jesus takes the scroll. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Anything new about that? Verse 10, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. That's the new part. This is a new song. Right now, we're not reigning. Right now, we might be underneath the principles in the kingdom of God. We might be abiding by God's precepts, God's commandments, God's law. But the world isn't. But when Jesus takes the scroll, we know Yes, it's going to be a seven-year process, but the new age has begun. And we are now kings and priests. And we're reigning with him on earth. And what's interesting is we will see all of this play out as we're in heaven, as it comes upon the earth, as we're getting ready for our reign with Jesus. Isn't that fantastic? Verse 11, oh, let's go further. And he says in the last part of verse 9, because I, don't, I want to do that, he says, you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. What a diverse kingdom. You have people of every color in the kingdom of God. You have different cultures in the kingdom of God. Different languages. But all of them are a part of God's kingdom. Because he's redeemed all of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. That's wonderful. Verse 11 and 12. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Just kind of mark that out because that's a horrible translation. Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor, and glory, and blessing. Now, after we sing the new song, then the angels join in worshiping Jesus. Now, the reason they didn't sing the new song with us is because they've not been redeemed. Hey, the devil doesn't have a second chance. When he fell, it was over for him. When the fallen angels went with him, it was over for them. It doesn't matter that Jesus died. Jesus did not die for the angels. And the angels that stayed with God... They've not been redeemed. Therefore, they cannot sing the new song because they're not going to be kings and priests with us and reign with Jesus on the earth. Does that make sense? But after we finish the new song, now the angels can join in worshiping Jesus. And you wouldn't believe how many angels there are in heaven. 
underline the phrase 10,000. That is a horrible translation. That phrase is translated from the Greek word murios, which means countless or an innumerable multitude. In fact, our English word myriad comes from this Greek word. A myriad is a large indefinite number. It means too many to count. Does that make sense? Now, let me show you how the New American Standard translates this verse because the New American Standard translates it correctly. And I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And the number of them was myriads of myriads. In other words, myriads times myriads. And thousands of thousands. What he was saying is, multiply innumerable, an innumerable amount times an innumerable amount. And then for good measure just add thousands of thousands. There's too many angels to count. Now, I'm going to make some application that doesn't go with Revelation. When I am praying the Lord's Prayer as an outline, and I get to the point where it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I know because of the book of Psalms that the angels are there to protect us lest we dash our foot upon a stone. So one of the things that I pray for my girls and my wife is that God would put angels around them listening to the Holy Spirit to guide and direct my daughters, to keep them from temptation and to deliver them from evil. If temptation is down the hallway, take them the other way. If there's evil up ahead, keep them behind it or keep them in front of it. But angels, I know that the Holy Spirit is omniscient. He knows all things. I pray for angels to listen to the Holy Spirit to protect my daughters. Now, you know, it's kind of interesting. I don't expect bad things to happen. I'm just that way. When I went to Israel, I had people say, well, weren't you scared? Oh, no. Well, in Egypt, when you were in Egypt, were you scared? No. When you were in Jordan, were you scared? No. In fact, you know, I'll tell you how I am. We got to Aqaba, which is in Jordan, a little town that's there on the Gulf of Aqaba where the Red Sea comes in parts. And that night, we had a little bit of time. I said, Lisa, uh, let's go walk around the town. And so we're walking around Aqaba, and there's policemen there with Uzis and all these machine guns. And, you know, I never felt scared. That's just the way I am. But I also know that I have angels around me listening to the Holy Spirit. And if I sense something, then I need to pay attention to it. But we need to understand something. When it comes to angels... And they are ministering angels to us. But when it comes to angels, there are myriads times myriads. And that's not enough to count them. So we say in thousands of thousands. You would not believe the created beings that God has. But not just the saints and the angels worship him. After we sing the new song, then the angels join in. But it's not just angels. All of creation joins in. Because remember in, in Romans, it tells us that all of creation has been subjected to futility. And they are groaning. They're desiring for us to be revealed. Why? So they can be redeemed. The earth wants to be redeemed. That's why when Jesus came in and people were praising him and the leaders came and said, you need to tell them to be quiet. He said, hey, if they don't worship, they don't say this, even the rocks will cry out. Nature will cry out one day when Jesus takes the scroll and they see the new age coming and the process beginning. Yes, this earth is going to do some horrible things. But I want you to understand when he takes that scroll, all of creation will begin praising Jesus at that time. Look at verse 13 and 14. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever and the four beasts and who are the four beasts? The four living creatures? They're angelic beings, but they represent what? Creation. They represent all of this. So when 
the created beings underneath them begin to worship after the created beings worship as Jesus takes the scroll. The four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty-four elders fell down, or the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Wow. Now I want you to understand this is a climactic event. Because once Jesus takes the scroll, he opens it up. Then now we're going to see next week, as we start with chapter six, the first seal is loosed, and out comes the white horse. The Messiah that the Orthodox Jews are looking for will come upon the scene. The problem is, the Messiah they're looking for is the Antichrist. And next week, we're going to find out what the term anti means. It has two meanings.